I don't want to, Dad. I hate it. I fucking hate it! Christopher, nine shrieks as his father, David, 41, swims alongside him, pushing him out into the windswept swell of a sunny Australian beach on Saturday morning. There's no need for swearing, his father advises him, buoyantly afloat upon a tan beer gut, with one hand paddling, other hand of his arm filled with tattoos of serpents and skulls, firmly gripping the mini mouth. The surf's nothing to be afraid of, mate. It's only water. Water can't hurt you. Not like an uppercutter and angry Roddy can. Look out there. He motions a dozen or so metres ahead to where a pack of men are sitting on longboards at the edge of a sandbank from which tiny waves peel untidily shoreward. Your Uncle Gaza, your Uncle Baza, even your Uncle Mix out getting amongst it. They don't look worried, do they? They're not afraid to get out there, and they drank a hell of a lot more than you did last night. As he swims, the water bobs around the two-day growth of David's chin, below his shaved head of hair and his neck, the thickness of which is reminiscent of an American staffies. I don't care about Uncle Dazza and Bazza. They're not even my real uncles. The kid wails, attempting to push his father's hands away from the wax deck, same time as trying to pull the red rashy that's riding up his back down to the hem of his oversized blue boardies. Christopher is a smaller, paler, far less muscular version of his father. A chubby little chap whose body's just crying out for the onset of puberty. His soft green eyes are a dead ringer for his dad's, and his ample head is likewise shaved. Watch out, David barks at him. We've got to get under this one, mate, so let's paddle, paddle, hang on, ready in, duck dive. I'm not ready! The child howls as the incoming wall of white water engulfs them. Such is the force with which the father helps to press down on the nose of the surfboard. The child of 30 kilos takes the brunt of the wave's impact and his soft, small palms slip away from the fiberglass rails. Whereas David's 95 kilo body breaks the surface of the water almost precisely where it's submerged, the board firmly between his calloused hands, Christopher emerges more than six feet closer to shore, coughing up what little salt water he's managed not to swallow. All right, Chris, David calls out to him. I wasn't ready, I said. I hate you. I hate you. This exclamation only seems to make the child's coughing all the worse. And he turns his back on his father to commence thrashing his way to the shore. Don't forget your board, mate. David cries after him. I don't want it! <coughs> I never wanted it! I hate surfing! Poor little fella, David thinks. It's not a bad board, not such a bad board at all. If he'd received a surfboard like this when he was a kid, he'd have been over the moon. Never mind though, he supposes. Laying down upon the deck now and commencing to paddle himself. A few dozen strokes and a couple of duck dives later, he makes it out to the fellas. Most certainly, they've heard his son shrieking and fallen silent out of respect, seemingly. Being no less than the sturdiest of tradesmen, in addition to a most patient, utmost believer in giving children a fair go, his own children foremost, David's in no way, shape or form about to feel either ashamed or emasculated. Sitting up on the mini male, he glances from one face to the next of the men sitting on their boards, bobbing in the tiny, sloppy swell. Chris will come round, he determines, hopefully. All at once they set about commiserating with him. Sure he'll get there, no doubt about it, mate. My own son was the same. Was he, Baz? David questioned. Fucking oath he was. Kicked and screamed, says Barry. 
Carried on like a pussy, chucked in the deep end. And now look at the bastard. He's pushing to get on that world tour. Michael pipes up. Your son, Baz, is a bloody ripper. Nearly took my fucking head off the other day, he did. That right, Mick? Too fucking right, mate. What? Pop the fins on you doing a cutty or something, did he? Yeah, well, nah, not a cut back anyway, Michael explains. He was pulling one of them bloody airs they pull nowadays, you know? Well, I'm flaming paddling over the shoulder. He's fucking come at me and I'm thinking, fuck, he's going to pull a cutty or something, going to spray me the cunt. But he fucking well flies up through the air. Cunt goes right the fuck up there like nobody's business, like one of them bloody fucking skateboard riders from California. Further than a Malaysia Airlines flight, Darren jokes. Did he land it or what? Land it? Nah, fuck no, he was just showing off. He come flying off us end of the cunt and just fucking fins whistle past me here, flaming board lands this fucking far from me. Mick indicates an inch between shaky thumb and forefinger. He was just fucking with you, mate. He's almost taken Mick's head off. That's fucking fantastic. Takes after his old man, eh? Like father, like son, you reckon, Baz? Fucking oath, you mark my words, Dave. Young Chris will keep, mate. He'll be dropping in on you before you know it. Yeah, Darren agrees. Appreciate it while you can, mate. Before he starts showing you up. Showing the lot of us up, mind you. Coming to watch the dogs tonight, Dazza? There's a bear shit in the woods. It's the only semi they'll play this year. I wouldn't miss it for the world, says Barry. What about you, Dave? You coming down the surf here to watch the dogs? All eyes turn to the coach of the under 10s. Gee, I love to, boys, David attests. Don't get me wrong, it's me and the missus' third year anniversary, though. After last year's effort, I'm a bit, how yeah, should I put it, I'm a bit like Matty John's trying to come back from that thing in the hotel room. This comparison's enough to baffle some of the boys. What, he hasn't fucking raped her, has he? Mick, you fucking drongo, of course he hasn't raped her. What the fuck goes on in your head, Mick? Well, I'm fucked if I know, Dave. You're the cunt what started talking about Matty Johns in the fucking hotel room. Probably not the greatest example there, Dave. That's probably fair enough, thanks, Daz. Maybe I should have gone with something else. What about uh, bloody Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey in something... Jim carrying something, what the fuck's he talking about now? His wedding anniversary, you galah. What about it? He fucking forgot it. What, today? Not today. Last year. This year he's got to make it up to her. Jesus Christ, you're as thick as two planks, Michael. Go fuck yourself, Darren. If she's got the shits because all he's done is forget a fucking wedding anniversary, he should tell the cunt to get fucked. Every fucking day is some cunt or other's anniversary. I say, fuck them. It's hardly a reason to miss the dogs. Mick, shut your mouth, mate. David puts his foot down. Now pull your fucking head in while you're at it. Darren's right. I've got to do the righty on this one. She's a special little lady, is Gloria. Heaven knows she deserves better than me forgetting last year. You've got to ask yourselves, how would the young blokes feel if we didn't throw an end-of-year bash for them? I want to show her how much I appreciate her. Surely this is the one day of the year for that. Cunt's got a fucking birthday, hasn't she? Mick! Dave told you to shut your trap, you fucking dickhead. It's not half obvious while you're still single, says Darren. No, you're right, Dave. You better have something special lined up, I reckon. I do, mate. That's why I can't make it to watch the dogs. What'd you get her? Fucking flowers. You'll need to do better than that. You'll need a card. Note in the card, flowers, fucking chocolates, a fancy fucking renovation, I mean reservation, a uh, fancy restaurant reservation. You'll need the whole flaming lot, won't you, Dave? It's all sorted, fellas, David proudly proclaims. I put a bit aside from me last stint in the mines. A grand I tucked away. I figure if I walk in anywhere with a grand in cash, then there's not much bloody point in making reservations. Heads up, boys. Here she comes. Set ahoy. A few lines of swell are approaching. David promptly swings shoreward and lies down on the board to paddle. As the mini mal whooshes down the face of the first wave, he rises up to stand tall. 
Like in the old surf flicks, he places his hands behind his back. Being such a small wave, there's no possibility of riding either high or low. David simply trims a line down the guts. And only when the crumbly mess closes out around him does it threaten to upend him. Yet with a quick steadying of his weight by taking a wider stance and throwing his arms either side of him, he remains in control and conquers it, white water and all. He's only average height, yet feels 10 feet tall as a couple of boys younger than Christopher and their mother watch from the shore. At the top of the dunes by the track to the car park, Christopher is sitting in the sand looking down at the sand while his stepsister, Chelsea, 11 and three quarters, stands in her togs, hat and sunglasses, a folded towel hanging between her arms crossed upon her breast. Did you see me? David asked them excitedly. I surfed right into the beach. We saw you stack it, if that's what you mean, Chelsea responds. Stack it, David remarks. That wasn't a stack, darling. That was merely a technical glitch in the old system. For this system of mines used to surf in much, much bigger waves. In the old days out on the points, I used to ride six footers on a nine foot mal. Big blue barrels of absolute perfection. Did you see your old man out there, Chris? Christopher trudges along behind David, who's following Chelsea. He says nothing. Not talking to me, eh? At least I know you weren't struck by a Portuguese man of war then. What about you, Chelsea? You didn't encounter any Portuguese man of war out there, did you? Why don't you just call them blue bottles like everybody else does? Ah, come on, Chels. It's good to learn the different names for things. It gets you enlightened. After all, it's not everybody what's privileged to grow up with a beautiful beach in their backyard. What about our poor cousins in Cooper Pedy? Or our indigenous cousins in the Simpson Desert? They wouldn't know a blue bottle from a bluefin. With this suggestion, his stepdaughter's distinctly unimpressed. Being in such a fine mood as he is, though, stoked on the wave, Dave's not about to let a bit of adolescent gloom get him down. He jogs a few steps to level with Chelsea and commences with flattery. I know you're a smart chick. I don't mean to annoy you by saying Portuguese man of war, darling. I'm just trying to prove to you that I'm not such an idiot as I look. Such a big, fat, stupid idiot, Christopher pipes up to clarify. It's all the sonar in the ocean these days, Chris, says Chelsea, as they arrive at the car. These big, stupid whales get confused. They beach themselves, then we're stuck with them. What? A mystified Christopher begs. Don't you know? Chelsea assumes the role of teacher. Whales, they communicate in this really low frequency. They get confused with other low frequency sounds like sonar. What's sonar? It's like an electric sound underwater. Like Morse code, Christopher presumes. I know about Morse code. Kind of like Morse code, Chelsea explains. Just imagine a whale's used to hearing other whales singing in a low voice. That's how they know where the other whales are, where the good food is and stuff. But then they hear a different low sound like a sonar from an oil station or something and they get confused because they think it's another whale. They get muddled up, uh, then they beach themselves. I thought they beached themselves because they got sick, Christopher counters. Some are sick, she concedes. Sometimes they die on the beach. Christopher supposes. Yeah, they do, she affirmed. Then they cut them up with chainsaws and send them to Japan to eat. Is that true, Dad? Nah, mate, she's only pulling your leg. She's good like that, Chelsea. A little joker she is, just like her mother, just like Gloria. <laughs>